Actually, thank you all for coming to our um, our presentation today. We are um, fortunate to have Dr. Shade Johns with us, and she is going to talk about her experiences and also give you some tips with regard to um, finding a postdoc and then being successful in that position. Um, so Dr. Johns is with our um, Institute for Drug and Alcohol Studies, where she's doing a, a postdoc fellowship with Dr. Jerry Moeller. She's working on um, some clinical trials with him in cocaine addicted patients. She received her um, bachelor's in psychology from Penn State University and then her master's and her PhD from um, Virginia State University. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Get started. She did also mention that she's happy to have this be an interactive conversation. So if you all have questions as she goes along, please feel free to um, ask those. Definitely. Thank you and thank you all for coming and please me, please don't hesitate to ask me um, any questions at any time. I'll also answer questions at the end. And I know sometimes people get a little nervous with their questions. So I'll have about maybe like 10 or 15 minutes to just kind of be around for the rest of the time. So today I'm going to teach you or give you some information on how to obtain a postdoc and thrive in it. And I can see that this a lot of people needed this information because you guys just packed the house. <laughs> So we're going to go over the definition of a postdoc and then the four W's of getting a postdoc. We're going to talk about the who, the why, the what, and the where. And then of course we're going to talk about the now what scenario where you've already got your postdoc position and then of course we'll have questions at the end. So the definition of a postdoc, a postdoc is someone that's already received their postdoctoral degree and they're interested in pursuing a postdoc because they want to get a little more research, maybe they haven't had a lot of publications, maybe they just want more um, balance and get a little more research experience. And sometimes folks I can help, definitely help with pursuing and taking advantage of getting into your future career. So why get a postdoc? The reason I went out for a postdoc for me is because it was required of what I wanted to do. Um, my goal is to be a director of clinical research and I knew that I was going to need that additional experience. Uh, Virginia State University is more geared towards teaching. So I have a lot of teaching experience. I think I, before I graduated, I taught maybe three or four courses. And of course, I had my experience in the lab with the research, but I hadn't published a paper. I hadn't written any grants. And I knew that those were some of the things that my future career was going to look for. I also wanted to make some connections. A postdoc is a great way to get different connections because you get to go to different conferences, you get to have a mentor that's very familiar with your area of research and can point you in the direction of different types of grants. And of course, it prepares you for your next career. And I also get a couple of perks that I like my postdoc. I like the free coffee <laughs> in the morning, you know, from the Keurig, it's the Keurig coffee, us. It's the best time. You know, we get free food. You know, I get Pizza Tuesday, Sandwich Friday. So, you know, I, you can't find that everywhere you are. And you also get time for writing. This is your time. Even though you're busy, you get a lot, a lot of time to write. I know sometimes I've been told by my um, mentor from graduate school, you know, you don't get a, t a lot of time to write when you're a faculty member. You're writing for meetings. You have different courses you have to take and do and teach and different things you have to do. And this is your time to just get in there and get your publications out. This is time for you. And I think before you get into a postdoc, you got to know what do you want to do. You know, you don't have to have the specific idea like I did, the clinical director for research, but some idea of what you want to do. And I always tell people what you should do is go out and find a job application of what you want to be. Because they'll actually tell you these are the things that we're looking for. These are some of our requirements. And they're like, OK, we're looking for someone with 15 publications. And you're like, OK, why well, do we have one? OK, well, I can use my postdoc, knock those publications out. You may not. Some people knock out 15. You may not. But it actually gets you right into the door. And then you have to think about, you know, do I want to stay in academia, or do I want to go industry? Now, I know there were some people that had some industry questions, and I'm not really familiar with industry, but I'm definitely familiar with academia. And you want to know which way you want to go. Do you want more of a research postdoc, or do you want more of a teaching postdoc where you're going to be in a classroom, and you're going to make your own syllabus, or you're just like, I like to be in the lab. Personally, I like numbers. I can do data all day. Some people find that very mundane. 
me, I thrive in it. It's like my little garden of heaven. <laughs> and I can do I can do that all day. And then what are you getting the postdoc for? Do you want to learn a new set of skills? Um, personally, I am not very familiar with you know fMRI and I wasn't very familiar with all the cognitive assessments. And I'm actually getting that training currently now. That's something new I wanted to do. Um, originally, I was more into Alzheimer's research and going to that, particularly in the African American community. And now my postdoc is actually in drug and alcohol studies. I went a whole different direction. I'm actually glad that I did because I love it and it's something new for me and I get to meet a new group of people. I love my participants. I tell people that all the time. It's a, new, it's a great new experience. And again, at any time you have any questions, please, please stop me. And then what type are you looking for? Again, are you looking for teaching? Are you looking for research? Are you looking, are you looking to do a little bit of both? And this information is, is very accessible. And I'll actually tell you and give you some suggestions on where you can actually go to find this information. So where do I find postdoc positions? You know, I think this is one of the bigger questions. And we're just going to kind of have a little list that I'll actually provide with you. And we'll just go down. So the first place you want to start is your mentor or your advisor. They're in the know. They know a lot of different faculty from different universities. And they may actually have an opening and you know about. And they actually know the PI of that lab, if that's where you want to go. Or sometimes faculty have experience in industry. Maybe they left industry to come to academia. And you can ask them about their experiences about that. And you can actually ask them about their steps. I used to talk to my graduate mentor about, you know, what was what was your postdoc like? You know, how did you get there? And he used to tell me that he used to sleep in the lab all day. He's like, that's what you're gonna do all day is sleep in the lab. And I was like, you sure? He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely sure. But you can start from there. Then, if your mentor or advisor doesn't have any good leads, go to your department. You know, VCU is very good about having a really good listserv of different postdoctoral opportunities, different career opportunities. You know, go to your career fairs if they're hosting anything or any types of hosted events. Because that way, especially if they have a career fair, you can actually talk to people, you know, one-on-one -on -one about different opportunities that are out there. And then the third thing you can do is go to different conferences. I know graduate maybe went to like a few conferences. And I know it's easy for us to present a poster and kind of walk off. You know, get out there and network. You know, if you see someone, a lot of the faculty members you might like will be there. You know, and you can actually go up to them and talk. They have little social aspects of conferences. If you see them lingering in the hall, go ahead and introduce yourself. I know introducing yourself to people can be scary. But once you start getting into the flow of that conversation, and they'll be like, oh, so you know, where are you at? What school are you from? And then you segue and you say, hey, you have any opportunities at your lab? Um, you know, this is where I am in my work right now. And a lot of them are very open and receptive. Or even if they don't have an opening in their lab, they can say, well, you know, I have a colleague of mine that's interested, you know, the same type of work that you're interested in. Allow me to pass you on that information. It's, it seems hard, but it's, it's really easy. And then, of course, we're, you know, some of us are part of societies and organizations. I'm a part of APA, or the American Psychological Association. They actually have a listserv where they show how you can do postdoctoral opportunities, like right here. Here we are. They have a whole link dedicated to post postdoctoral fellowships. They'll ask you if you want to research one. Do you want to practice? They actually have some information about getting the skinny on the postdoc, or should you do it? And I think stuff like this is great. These resources are out there, and they're phenomenal. Um, APIC has the same thing, and APIC is more towards people that are actually going, I didn't go the clinical route, I went the research route, so I know my, a lot of my clinical psychology colleagues went for APIC, and they were able to actually go in there, do some searching, and things like that, and that's helped serve them. And I know I have different backgrounds in here, so for those of you who aren't psychology, there's such inside higher ed careers. You can actually look up postdoc in the search engine, wherever you want to go. You don't have to stay. In Richmond, you can go to California, Wyoming, Boston, you know, wherever you wherever you want to go, you can search it within here. But if you do want to stay close to home, 
definitely be like, oh, I want to stay within 20 miles of where I am. <laughs> you can use this. This place actually has an app. So you even got to get on the internet. You can just download the app and find what you need. I like apps. Apps are fun. We also have naturejobs.com. They also have a nice search engine. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Simple and easy, and it's great. And then, of course, if you've exhausted one through four, and you're still not finding anything, do a school search. I knew from the very moment I went to grad school that I wanted to do my postdoc at UCF. I had nowhere else I wanted to go. I did put out other things, just in case that fell. I had a backup plan. I was going to live at home. <laughs> you know, cry about it for about six months and then get back out there and search. But I knew where I wanted to be because VCU is just a beautiful campus. It's a beautiful environment. And I knew that if I got in this environment that I was going to grow. So if you're like, you know what? I don't know. I'm going to do a postdoc at Harvard. Harvard actually has a postdoc page with all their opportunities on it. And you can look that up easily. It's right there. Start to over postdoc. They'll tell you how to get there, the application process, what you need. And it's as it's, it's simple as that. And then if that doesn't work, you can do an internet search and you can go to indeed.com. I know what you're thinking. Indeed has postdocs. Yes, they do. <laughs> That's like your, do that as your last resort. But yes, you can find. Um, post <coughs> postings on Indeed, Monster Jobs, whatever those are the little job websites that are, just in case you're like, I just can't find anything I want and you <coughs> gather from different places. And you can, you can gather. You can get an idea from your mentor. You can get an idea from the listserv in your department because you're going to want to fill out a lot of applications. So what does the postdoc application consist of? First and foremost, you're going to do a lot of postdoc <coughs> applications. I've heard, I think my friends have done anywhere from 15 to 20 applications. Yeah, so your eyes like, ooh, what's that? Yeah, it's a lot. And usually when you get your little description of your postdoc, they're going to ask for a couple of things. They're going to ask for a cover letter. They're going to ask for your CV. And your CV is very important. And what I call it is an active document. Now, I'm not saying I haven't shelled my CV for like six months and been like, oh, I need my CV. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is old. This is not up to date at all. You want to consistently update your CV. If you went to a conference this month, go ahead. Put it, go ahead, put it on there. Because you might forget all the things you've done, all the grants you've written, all the papers you've published, you know, all the talks you've given, and you're like, now you're scrambling to get the CV together. Well, when did I do that? What date was that? And if you just actively do it, it's not even in the forefront of your mind, and that's one less thing for application you have to do. And remember, have your publications on there. Have your grants. If you have teaching experience, put that on there too. But look at the postdoc application. If it's really focal on teaching, make sure that stuff's at the top. You know, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's great. You did some research, but what classes did you teach? If it's research focused, make sure that stuff's at the top. And then put your teaching classes, you know, somewhere down lower. It's not to say they're not important, but you want their eyes to be drawn to the most important information on your CV first. And they're not looking around. Because trust and believe, they're taking maybe five minutes, if that, to look at your application. <clears throat> and you want them to be focused on what you need to be focused on. And then, of course, you'll need your research statement, which you'll have to have prepared. And I tell people, write your research statement and have several people read it. Have your mentor, if they're available, to read it. Have your best friend read it. Have people from different departments read it. One of my really good friends was in the English department, so I sent it to her. I had a lot of typos in there because I was up 2 a.m. trying to write the thing and get it together. Because that's what you do when you're working in the lab. You're sleeping there. You're waking up. Like, i got to write this. You know, because sometimes you rush. Then I actually gave it to someone in a different field because I wanted to know if they could understand it. Because you never know who's looking at your postdoc application. It could be anything. And you want to be able to convey your thoughts to any audience. And once you've had those group of people read it, then, you know, give it a final brush over, add your additions, and then you're good to go. Never just, never just send blindly. And then another thing they're going to want, they're going to want at least three recommendation letters. 
and I tell people, for your recommendation letters, please get someone that likes you. <laughs> because I have heard horror stories of people that have gotten bad recommendation letters. And you'll know if someone likes you. You know, you'll know. So the first person you want to get is usually your mentor or your PI because they know who you are. They know your work ethic. And give them the description of the postdoc as well because they want to know what you're applying for, what, what's the expectation, and they can actually cater their um, recommendation to that. And that's what you want. You know, don't give them everything up front so it can be easy. Then you want to go to someone else secondary that's worked with you and what you're doing. I know I got my recommendations from my PI. I got a recommendation member from, because uh, I was teaching and there was actually a professor that was overall teaching, so she knew my teaching ethic and she was there. She knew how I wrote my syllabus, so I was able to get one from her. And then I also, which is weird, I did it because I was president at the time of my sorority, because I didn't really interact with a lot of faculty members, and I think people should do that, interact with a lot more <coughs> faculty members so you get that experience. I actually got a recommendation letter from there, but that was more about my leadership skills. You gotta cater it some cater it somehow. You gotta work with what you can work with. So if you're feeling like, okay, who are the top three people in my mind that I can get this recommendation letter? You go snap, snap, snap. Because you want to be able to do that because you want to be able to give them time. People are busy. You know, if your application is due in a week, I don't know how you're going to turn around a recommendation letter in a week. I give people two to three months to write a recommendation letter. Because I'm going to ask you about the recommendation letter and you're going to forget. You know, there's a thousand things going on for a PI and you're going to forget. So I give you a week to forget. Then I come to you and I say, what about that recommendation letter? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me get that on there. So now they're thinking about it. They're typing it up. And you finally get it. And you're like, you spelled my name wrong in here. So now you got to go back because you never know. You know, look it over. Sometimes P.I. let you read the recommendation letter. You no, know, I'll be like, add an extra sentence about how awesome I am. She's awesome. And then you send it back. And then you get it. And it's good. And it's golden. And you can send everything off. Because really, that's, that's the waiting part of your postdoc application, it's the recommendation. Because you'll have your research statement, you'll have your cover letter, you'll have your CV. That's the longest waiting period. <clears throat> yes? On the research statement, you mentioned that you've switched focus quite a bit between your PhD and your postdoc. How do you handle the research statement when you're doing that? I actually did that. I'll take that into the research statement. Well, what I did was, because I was in my postdoc and I actually worked with behavioral measures that were still with working memory and pretty similar to what I was doing, even though I'm an alcohol and drug studies, we still have types of measures that deal with um, working memory and stuff like that. So I was able to spin, like, this is where I came from, but this is what I'm going to add on to that. So because you don't want to demote yourself in your research statement. You want to say, well, I'm not familiar. If you grasp one of something that they're looking for, you say, well, this is how this my research can translate into the new research that I'm doing. Did that answer your question? Okay, great. Anybody else have any questions? Please don't hesitate to raise your hand. So what should you do? Start a year in advance. A year. Because you have to gather everything and you have 15 to 20 applications to fill out. You can't do them all. And you're also doing stuff. Grad school is still hard in the last year. I don't know if anybody, you know, who told you it was easy, but that's dissertation year. And you're meeting with your committees, and if you're teaching classes, three or four classes like I was, you're, you're still running around, your students are coming after you. You're failing me. What's going on with my grade? So you don't really have this real sit down time for you. I was also working in the lab at the same time. So you have to carve out some time. It's a, it's a year process. Just, just do it. Because it's not going to seem like a year to you. Because you're going to be pushing everything out. You're going to be filling everything out. You're going to be doing your research. Because you're also do, using that year to research the postdoc that you're applying to. You don't want to go into that finally. You need to you know, you gotta look up the PI and everything. So give yourself time. Again, update your CV. I think I've said that like three or four times. It's very important. Update your CV. And then you're going to also use this time to connect with postdocs that are already in their position. It is okay to reach out to other postdocs. I'm okay with it. I know other people are okay with it. 
it's a simple email click of introducing yourself and saying, oh, I'm interested in a certain PI's lab. You know, here's, you know, so-and-so on the website. Let me send an email. The worst thing you can get is a no reply. That's all you're going to get. That's the worst thing you'll get is no reply. Try the next person. Some labs have multiple posts. Some labs only have one. I'm the only one at mine. So, you know, keep going. You don't get a response from that lab, go to the next lab that you were thinking about. Someone's going to respond to you, and you ask them, what's the environment like? What's your day-to-day -day like? What's, what's your PI like on a good day and a bad day? Do you, you want all this information? How do, how, do you, how do you feel about it? Are you happy? You know, they might not tell you if they have not. I'll be honest with you. I don't know. But I'm actually pretty happy. You know, you want to get a feel of where you're going. You know, what's the expectation, you know, while you're there? <clears throat> You know, how many papers are you publishing on a regular basis? Sometimes you can just look them up, look the postdoc up. They're probably on the internet. Get a look and go, oh my gosh. You know, they tell you I've been in this postdoc for two years and you're looking at their um, their papers and you're like, wow, they published 10 papers in, in two years. Is that the expectation of the lab or is that just a really gung-ho postdoc? And then also when you're reading the descriptions, don't let them scare you. The postdoc description is the perfect postdoc in the world because that's what everybody wants. They want a postdoc that can do it all. You know, I want a postdoc that can <coughs> run SPSS and R and juggle five studies and make sure my data is on point all the same time, all, all within a day. They're just doing this all within a day. And just grab, if you're not good at SPSS, there's free courses online that will teach you about SPSS. If you're not great at stats, there are free courses online to help you brush up on your stats. If you're not familiar with R, they have free R courses. Get, get enough just to know, because trust me, a lot of people getting into positions don't always know everything, but they come in with something. And you don't want to apply because you're like, well, I don't have all the 10 things that were listed on here. If you have four or five, it never hurts to apply, because again, the worst thing you can get is a rejection. And rejection hurts, it's, it does, because it makes you sad, makes you feel like you're not doing the right thing, am I going in the right direction? But that doesn't mean that that rejection could be an acceptance. You're like, wow, got this awesome postdoc I never even would have thought to apply for, because there's thousands of people applying for the same position you are, and they're gonna get rejections too, for one spot. So you might as well just add yourself to the pile. Because once you get rejected, once it's easy to get rejected, you're like, oh, well, all right, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm better. That's all you have to go on. You can be like, I'm awesome. And if they didn't accept me, they're just missing out on my awesomeness. And that's how you have to go through this application process, any, any job process. At, you know, post <coughs> faculty, that's what you have to do. Don't diminish your self-worth because somebody rejected you. And maybe if that's a good thing, because maybe you would have gotten a lab and not liked it at all. And then you would have been searching for another postdoc somewhere else. You will find where you're supposed to fit. So what do I look for in a mentor? Now, everybody's different. But yes. Just before you move on to your next section. Sure. Um, I was curious what your your experience timeline was from the from the time that you saw the opening for the postdoc that you're in now to the date that you got the official offer. Like how long did that take? That's a good question because I'm unconventional. <laughs> so I started my um, postdoc search actually the year. I went to several um, fMRI conferences. They're actually free. Look them up if you're interested in fMRI. And I actually connected with someone that actually offered me a postdoc. And she's like, when you get out, hit me up. So I was just kind of lingering around because I was like, well, I can hit her up. And I saw an opening at VCU for a research assistant position. And I know that's kind of weird, because you're like, you're in grad school and you're getting a research assistant, but most of the time that's undergrad. And I actually got accepted to come into the interview because my current mentor thought it was funny that as a future PhD, I was applying for a research assistant position. So you would see who that was. So I went in, slammed my you know, interview, and he actually created a postdoctoral fellowship for me. So I was a research assistant for a few months, and then I got him into a postdoc position. So that's how I did. That's how I was. I was unconventional. There was there was no there was no application for me. But it could be unconventional for others that way too. You know, a postdoc position you could slam it out the park somewhere, 
because my mentor wasn't even considering a new postdoc at all. He was like, no. So you, you could slam it out the park somewhere, and they'd be like, you know what? I need a postdoc, and I need that one right there. So that's how I got mine. So back to what we look for in a mentor. Everybody's different. Some people don't want to be bothered with their mentor. I want to see you once a month. Don't come looking for me. Don't hover over me because I'm doing my job. I'm going to send you some emails. That's how we're going to do And sometimes some PIs have to work like that because depending on how famous your PI is, how busy your PI is, then you might not see them for a while in the lab. You might look around and go, do I even have a PI? Does he, even, he or she even exist? So you have to say to yourself, if you see someone that's like really busy like that, can you work in that type of environment? Personally, no. And when I sat down with my tutor, I was like, I need to see you once a week. Whatever day that is, we have a set time once a week because I need, and it's more for me because I'm a very last minute person. In grad school, I wrote papers like two hours before they were due, 20 pages, still got A's on. So I work, I work under pressure. And I knew if I didn't have that meeting, you would be asking me for some stuff. And I'd be like, I'm trying to struggle the night before, trying to get it all done. Don't do that as opposed to, don't, don't do it. Sometimes you have to, but don't, don't do it. And so I needed that. And then what type of mentor do you want personality rise? You know, you need someone that's like, oh, you know, that paper, oh, you know, it was good. Maybe you should try again. Or do you want someone who's like, okay, when you started out the paper, it was pretty good, but then I got down to it and it was crap. You know, what type of person do you need to motivate you in your workplace? Because everybody, everybody's different. People's temperaments are different. And what kind can you work over? I can tell you now, my PI hovers over me like a helicopter. Okay? And I just politely ask you to not hover over me because the whirring of your helicopter is in my ear. And we have that, but we have that type of jokey, jokey relationship. You know, you might be best friends with your PI. You might not like your PI, you know? So you got to figure out how you're going to work in that environment. And then, when you're looking, you want to know, sorry, we're good. But yeah, that's it. That's all I'm saying. Any questions? Yes? How does the role of a mentor change when it comes to a PhD student versus a postdoc student? Uh, like just in my personal experience right now, in a PhD stage, I would want my mentor to be uh, hovering like a helicopter, but probably with, when it comes to a postdoc, I would want myself to be more independent. So. What do you kind of look for in terms of that, uh, like, in a mentor? Okay, so I think what, you, what you'll have to do with that, like, I've, I've had my graduate mentor hovered in this university. I think that's what you have to, that's where you get that information. Remember I said, you know, check out, talk to other postdocs. That's where you're going to get that information from. Because when you meet them face to face, you're not going to know their temperament or personality. So the post office will tell you when you email them like what's your what's your work environment like your mentor? And they're like, oh he's barely here. I have I have a lot of independence. He just checks in from time to time to make sure things are going great in the lab. I send him an email maybe once a week. Because with independence you you gotta do some sort of check-in. So maybe you're checking, they're like, oh, everybody does about once a week check-in with them. And then he just sends an email back saying everything's fine. That's how you'll, that's how you move from that. Personally, with my experience, I got the same. It, it, never, it never changed. But for me, I'm okay with that because I'm used to it. So it didn't really, it doesn't really bother me. Um, you can ask, and I always tell people, you can ask for a bit more independence. I have, I get it for five days and then it goes back. So you gotta keep, you gotta keep, you gotta keep, you gotta keep asking. But that's how you would find that information. And was I going to answer your question? Great. Any other questions? No. That's so quiet. Two people in the back, yeah. Be the back. So what does the postdoc position offer? All the things, that's what I say, all the things, salary, it's not that great. Mine's not that great. Don't get excited. But salary difference is this difference. So, you know, my salary is around, you know, the mid range. But I've seen other people's salary could be anywhere from fifty-five thousand a year, ninety thousand a year, depending on where you're going. Industry. I do have friends in industry. First year entry, ninety thousand a year. And that's. I don't know if that's 
a staple for all of them, but where he was, that's what his was. I've seen post as low as 42. NIH now is 48,000. So you got to think about, you know, what you're doing, how's your life moving, because, you know, for my field, it's, it's a slow, it's a slow process. But you also get some health insurance. We get all these little health insurance. I get sick from time to time. I remember being in grad school, and I got sick, and I was like, well, I'm going to just drink this tea and honey, because that cures everything. Robitussin cures everything. You know, you break your leg, pour some Robitussin. <laughs> you, know, you, you got a call in Robitussin. You know, you, your liver's not functioning. Robitessa. That's what you had to do in grad school, and you kept going to the lab, and you kept pushing yourself because you was like, I gotta get out of here. And that's what you did. But, post doc, you get health insurance. I feel good. My health insurance card, walking to the doctor, and you know, I throw it down like this, so you know, an American Express black card. Bam! I need help. I need some real meds. Thank you. Because Pez was my meds. I don't, man, it might work. You know, it might have a placebo effect if I pretend with the car. Maybe this will work. But now you have that. Then you want to check and see if they have moving funds. Because some postdoc positions offer that. So if you're over here in Virginia, and you're trying to roll out to California, hey, you got a little money? And how much money do you have? Like, it's $500. I'm like, yes, we're going to make that cross-country trip. And my one friend's going to drive here. Then I'm going to stay with my friend here. And they're going to drive there. We're going to make that $500 work. You know, that's how you got to do that. And then you want to know, do they have travel funds for conferences? Because you want to be able to go to a conference, and you want somebody looking at you like, well, if you pay out of pocket, you know, you might be able to go to that conference. And how much are the travel funds? You know, is it feasible for you to be able to go to two to three conferences your very first year? You want to kind of get your feet wet. You want to go. You want to present. You know, check that out. And then you want to check out. Are you able to have your own studies while you're there? Most people, you know, I personally, I'm working on both of my PI's projects. And we've talked about, you know, when can I have my own project and in the wave and the timeline of things. But you're going to have to stick up for yourself. If there's something that you want to do, you know, present your idea. Because what you don't want to do is be overshadowed by your PI. Because when you do get out, wherever you're going, you know, such as academia, they want to know that you can stand alone a bit. They don't want to be like, so you're just working on this one thing in their project, you never had your own side project or side ideas. And you want to be able to do those things. You got to ask, can I do that? And then you want to know what project you're going to be working on. You want to, you want to, you want to know what's going on. What, what, what project do I have? You know, who's working on that project? Because if you get into a project like me and there's no research assistance, this is just you, you're like, oh my gosh. I gotta do this all by myself. I, I gotta figure this out. I figured it out. <laughs> but you, know, you, you just wanna know what's going on and, and, and where is the project at? I got in on a project that was you know, coming into almost its second year. Are you coming into a very new project? Maybe they just got the grant for the project. You know, who's, who's setting that up? You want, you want that information before you get in there. And then you wanna know about the lab productivity. What, what's the expectation? Um, for me, my expectation for my PI is that I have to publish three to four journal articles every year, two of which have to be first Arthur. I'm at two already. I just have to get my two first Arthurs. Those are the goals. So you already know, okay, this is what I have to do. However, if you come into a lab like mine, they might already have data already there. It's just in there from other studies. No one's looked at it. No one's analyzed it. So that could be very well feasible because you just got to come up with a question, run some data, there's a paper. Now, if you're coming into a new lab and there's nothing, you might be like, look, you got to cut that expectation. I mean, we get one to two, you know, not to three or four. And then you want to know, okay, what's the data expectations? You know, when's the data got to be entered? How long does it take? Some people have to have data entered and they have milestones, and they got to have that within three days. You got to be pushing that out. So you have to, you know, organize your time so you can reach those lab expectations. My lab expectation is to attend a lot of meetings. We have about six to seven meetings a week, and I'm expected to be at all of them. One's in the morning, one's in the evening, and then Friday all the rest of the meetings happen in conjunction back to back. 
Although I feel like it's the same information. That's okay, because I'm there. You know, that's the expectation. And you don't want to miss a meeting because they will surely know. That's my lab expectation. Your lab expectation might be one meeting a month. And you just got to be at that, that one meeting. Be at the meetings. Sometimes there's food. Sometimes there's not. So you'll know which one there's food at and which ones there's not. And you can just eat. Now, does your postdoc have a retirement benefit? Some postdocs do. They actually allow you to get into a retirement plan. Check that out. Because you want that money lingering around for retirement. But also make sure your 401k rolls over because it always doesn't. A side note. And then does it offer career counseling? You know, a lot of postdocs actually have places where you can go and get career development with the school you're working with or wherever you are. So you're not out there flailing around. They can actually help you plan the next step. Because you don't want to plan the next step at the end of your postdoc. You really want to plan your next step. I was, I already had my life plan since I was 16, so I, I don't know what everybody else's plan is, but I knew I wanted to be a, a psychologist at 16. I knew where I wanted to be. I knew how I wanted to do it. So my plan was just kind of toning everything up. But if you're not sure, maybe you don't know where you want to do this. This postdoc is another time to soul search. I know people tell you soul searching happens in undergrad. You're still soul searching in grad school. Okay, I don't know if you had the quarter life crisis. I did. You can still soul search in your postdoc because there's a little time. You got two to three years. Figure, get it out together. Figure it out. But fine tune it. Fine tune it more. Maybe you want to go in academia. You just don't know where. You don't know if you want to go to a big research school. Maybe you just want to go to just a teaching school. You know, kind of fine tune it and figure it out. This is your time. And then you want to see if they have any, you know, housing accommodations, because some places actually do have housing for postdocs, which is amazing. I think that's great. Or they actually tell you where you can get housing at an affordable price because you're broke. You know you need to live someplace. And sometimes you don't want to eat top ramen for the rest of the life. Sometimes you want Qdoba on Friday. And rent is going to determine if you get top ramen or Qdoba because you're still eating that. You eat that in grad school. You're going to eat it through your postdoc. I know you want, you know, the chicken. Maybe we can upgrade you to the shrimp. I don't know. So you just got to gotta figure that out, too. So once you've done all of this, done your application, it's all great. you got, like, five offers. You're like, who am I going to choose? You feel good about yourself. You chose somebody. You felt the lab experience was good. You met with the PI. Oh, that person's great. He or she's great. You like the lab. You like your lab mates. And now you're there. You got your health card, insurance card. You're balling now. You're like, mm, got a couple more dollars in the cafe and you can do it. So now what you going to do? What are you going to do while you're there? What's your experience going to be like? Um, it's not any different than grad school. The only thing different is you're not going to class. Oh, that's a lie. You might have to take some courses. You know, extra, you know I have to take a course now, you know, to get that extra experience. But if you don't sleep now, you're not going to sleep. If you don't eat now, you're not going to eat now. You know, the only difference is, is that you're getting a bigger salary, but you're still there. They're going to say in your application, oh, you're 40, 40 hours. That's a lie. You work more than 40 hours. I think my longest week hours is 70 hours a week. You get paid for 40. Just remember that. There's no overtime for you. There's no extra little, oh, I'm going to make a little extra in this paycheck. No, same paycheck, long hours. Sometimes some of us are in the lab till 9, 10 o'clock at night. I personally like to come in in the morning. I see the sunrise. I hear the birds chirp. Because I, I don't know, something about me, I have to go home when it's light outside. Or I feel like I just wasted the day. So I'll just come in two hours early. That's my time to work. And I'll get what I need to get done. And you still stay the whole time. Don't think because you come in early, you can leave early. There's no such thing as leaving early. Because your PI is lurking around. If you have one that's a helicopter, lurking around, stopping by your office. Hey, what's you doing? Working great. Making the rounds. So you know. You're just going to be there. But I think the, the key to succeeding in your postdoc is establishing some goals. Weekly goals, <coughs> monthly goals, daily goals. What am I going to accomplish today? What am I going to accomplish tomorrow? What am I going to accomplish this week? 
you have to be your own person because no one is going to be like, hey, I asked you for that data last week and you haven't gotten it because your PR sometimes is very busy. And sometimes that can work in your favor, especially if you're stressed and you're doing a lot and they conveniently forget what they ask you for. You're like, ooh, I can push that off in a couple of days and then you just send it off. And they're like, oh, when did I ask for this? You know, yesterday. You know, make up something in your mind. You know, you can get that, but goals will definitely help you, especially, you know, you want to sit down with your PI and actually develop some sort of postdoc development plan. They also call it an individual development plan now. And if your postdoc is two years, you want to sit down and say, what are we, because this is a we situation, going to accomplish in these two years? How many publications am I going to get out? How many conferences I'm going to go to? You know, what new techniques or assessments am I going to learn? And you got to check that plan every month to make sure you're reaching the milestones. Because again, your PI is busy. They're not going to be like, hey, you're supposed to publish a paper every six months. Sometimes it doesn't work like that. Sometimes they just keep moving and you'll get you'll get lost in the trail. You don't want to get you don't want to get lost. So you have to keep yourself on point for that. And then publish, publish, publish. This is your time to publish. Go to conferences. They're free. Use all of that money. If they're like, you got five thousand dollars, use all of it. You know, don't, don't be like, I'm gonna use some here. Use all of it. It'll replenish next year. Use all of it. Go out there and network. Oh, this is your chance to network. If you have a really good mentor PI, they know a lot of people. And they're going to introduce you to different people. And they're going to be like, oh, this is, this is my post on tour And you're like, oh, yeah, that's me. And you'll see them. And that's another connection because you know what that is? That's a recommendation letter. When you get out of your post up, you know what that is? That's an invitation to some private dinner that you wasn't invited to. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to go there. And I'm going to do that. Or that could be an opening for a new project, a new side project. You know, I like how you work with your PI. You know, you have a very good attitude. Would you like to work on a side project? I actually got asked to work in cardiology. So work on a side I know nothing about cardiology. But I said, yes. I'm going to learn today. I'm going to learn all about cardiology. You know, whatever you need me to do, you just need me to stand in the room. I get the heart rate moving. That's all I can do that. You know, so get, use those opportunities. Get out there. And I know I say, I just told you I work sometimes to set me out, work week, and you're thinking to yourself, so what do you do? What's your life like? Shot at What's your life? I don't know. Working, sleeping. Sometimes I play video games. There's a little time to squeeze, to squeeze in some pleasures. You gotta make some time for yourself. My time is that two hour period in the morning. I get my coffee. I'm listening to my music, my Jill Scott, when I'm in the car, it's very soothing. I don't answer emails till 8 a.m. I get emails. I, when I was in graduate school, my, my PI used to email me and call me at 3 a.m. in the morning because that's when he got his best ideas. And my silly self was answering those things at 3 a.m. in the morning. Not today because if you email me at 3 in the morning, chances are I can't do anything about it until I get to work. So just turn it off. Don't even answer them. They pile up. I've had maybe five, ten emails before I get in there. I'll answer them in my due time. Go pick up your Starbucks. Yes, you can afford Starbucks on your post doc <laughs> And you don't want to go there every day. I don't know if you're going to earn those rewards. But you can go get your little drink, sip your coffee at your desk because it's quiet. It's quiet when I go in because work doesn't start to me for 830. Whole building is quiet. The whole building is shut down. And I can just relax. I can get some stuff done if I want to. You know, I barely eat breakfast now. So, you know, that's the only way I'm going to get a breakfast. Because if you try to eat while you're at work, it's not going to happen. You know, everybody's bothering you. you know, PI's bothering you. The research systems, you know, they're asking you a thousand questions. Because you know you're the person to go to for the research system. And you got to set a good example. And you got to know every question. If you don't know the question, you don't want to answer. You just do that whole little look and go, you know what? I'll look that up. I got you. I don't have it right now because my mind's really focused on a lot of projects, but I'll get that to you. That works every time. Every time it works. And you, because you don't know. You can't let them know you don't know. You get the answer, and you go about your way. There's going to be a thousand people. If you're with me, like I am, I work with different participants. I'm on two different studies. So I may have three or four participants in one day, plus the data needs to be done, plus the paper needs to be written, plus the grant needs to be written. So you have to find some time for yourself, or you're going to stress yourself out, and you don't want to burn out. Because I remember grad school burnout. I burn out. 
my third year of grad school. And when the burnout happens, you start reflecting on, am I in the right place? Is this what I want to do? Because you're just really tired and you're finding everything overwhelming because you haven't taken that time to sit back and just do one of those. So you have to do one of those in your postdoc. And if someone gets on you for that, you talk to the hand, wave them off Wanda, because you need a break. Because this whole ship's going to go down because you're an important part of the ship. And so your PI may be steering ship, but you handling the sails, and you looking out for the whales, and you keeping the pirates out, and you can do all that. You deserve a new side moment. And I also tell you, stick up for yourself. It's very hard sometimes to transition from the grad school to postdoc mentality. It's a very different mentality. In grad school, it's one of those things where you feel like if the PI says to do something, you gotta say yes. Yes, 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 because I, I want my recommendation letter and you know I need help. And it seems like you have to do that all the time. You don't have to do that in your postdoc. It's okay to say no, because guess what? You're a doctor too, okay? Just because you haven't been in there for like 35, 40 years, you don't have 170 publications like my PI does, you know, you can still say, hey, it's getting a little overwhelming. I know one of my things I came up with is that I get a day-to-day -day now. I never used to have a day-to-day. -day. It's just a day dedicated to where I do data all day. Because I had to tell my PI, I'm getting overwhelmed. You want me to run however many participants in a day? You want me to get this done, get that done? But if all these people need me and I'm here all these times, it's not going to get done. But you don't just go, I just need this day. You have to come up with the reasons you need today, how the day helps, how it helps them, because just, oh, well, I can get your data done and get to you faster than I normally get you. And he was like, hmm, that sounds great. So now I have a day to day. If you're one of those postdocs that works seven days a week, like I've been working this week, you got to sit down and say, hey, work seven days a week. I need a day. One, one day. And I promise to pick the day that's the least busiest. Can I have that day? The worst answer you can get is no. I got a yes. Kind of. Taking it anyway. Um, so you know you have to be able to talk to your cat. It's a relationship. Don't be don't be afraid of your mentor. This is you're building something here. This is someone you're gonna be with for two to three years. And if you can't ask for something as simple as vacation, take your vacation day. ECU gives you 20. Take all 20 of them. Don't let somebody say, you can't take vacations. Or when I was a postdoc, I didn't take vacations. That's great. I'm going to take a vacation. <laughs> and then when you go on vacation, go away. Even if your vacation is sleeping in your bed, lie and say you're going somewhere because they'll call you because I've been called off vacation several times. And I had to learn because I'm one of those people I like to, I'm working all the time, I like to work, and when it comes to my participants, I really care about them. So if somebody calls me and I'm on vacation and they know that I'm home, I'm going to come running because I know my participant needs me. And you build a relationship with your participants, and I'm happy to see them, but at the same time, I'm like, well, that wasn't a vacation at all, because I was sitting here in the lab. Turn your phone off. Who needs you? Okay, maybe your parents need you. Keep it on for them. You know, do the do not disturb. You got those, they got that on your phone, and let certain people call you. Because the emails can wait. If you're off for a week, what are you going to do? How are you going to work for your PI if you're off for a week? Don't take your work home. Don't do it. You have all your life to take work home. Even in all your life, don't do it. And I say this because I have an experience with that. I watch my parents work all their life you know my family missed out on a lot of things when i was growing up in school a lot of plays a lot of things that i wanted to be at but as a kid you understand that you're like you know well, food has to get on the table somehow my parents always said well when we retire we're gonna a b c and d we're gonna go on different trips we're gonna go on different cruises you know we're gonna take you to disneyland because we didn't take you you know all these plans and then my father passed away at 16 when i was 16. and all those plans that my parents had made just went out the window. Because life is short. My mom has not taken any vacation since my dad passed She's almost 60 years old. She's 60 this week. Tomorrow, actually. And I don't want you guys getting into that rut because it starts now. It starts with grad school. Then you're working through your postdoc. Then you're working in academia. You're working in industry. And you've yet to take a day off. And the next thing you know, you're looking up. And it's time for retirement. And you're like, well, what did I 
Well, what did I do? I didn't have any time for myself. And you can balance, you can balance it. People say you can't balance work and food, but you just give yourself some time. I'm not saying you gotta be gone for 30 days out of the month every time. Cause I would look at you funny like, you taking a vacation every month? <laughs> Is there that many places for you to visit? You know, stay here for a minute. You know, I don't even know who you are anymore. You know, but just, you know, maybe every two, three months, you know, take something. If you need a mental health day, use your vacation day. I need a mental health day. You, you know, no one can deny you your vacation. You know, sometimes you need a mental health day. You don't want to go in and be like, gosh, I just, if I don't get this coffee, it's going to be up the roof through here. Just take your day and, you know, come back and start again. And also, when you're in your position, check out the resources of where you're at. Because BCU is awesome. Awesome resources. They have a whole postdoc page telling me how to get started. They have different types of small grant programs that you can apply for. They have tr extra travel funds. So not only do you have already have travel funds from where you are, these they got extra travel funds, which means to me more conferences. And I'm gonna look for conferences in nice places like Hawaii because I only have to present on one day, but I'm gonna be there for three. And I'm just saying those waves look. They're looking kind of great. I'm going to be like, you know what? There's a conference in Germany. I got to go to that. Now, your PI might be like, do you really need to go all the way to Germany? And you got to be like, yes. Yes, I do. I can't, I can't learn this information anywhere else. Granted, they're holding some in Chicago. But that doesn't matter because we're not going to mention that. I need this one. And be like, hey, it's not coming out of your child budget. It's coming from over here. And you'll be like, oh, OK. OK, have fun. Yeah. Make sure you go to an October fest. You go to, you know, pick the right times to go to places. And then they also have a career development fund. And then what you also want to do, you know, is they have a national postdoc association. Join your postdoc association when you get there because that's a wealth of information. And being a postdoc, you're in a room. It's kind of kind of lonely, you know, because you're you're in by yourself. You're working. You're working constantly. You're working. And this is a great way for you to connect with other postdocs that are already there, that are new just like you. You have someone you can give your grievances to, because everybody can't give their grievances to everybody. Everybody, some people are open with different people in their lives. This is someone to be like, I understand exactly what you're talking about, because people might be in different different places that you are. They also have free ice cream socials. Anytime there's free food, just like in high school, go where free food is. Go, go, go where free food is. They also host different events to help you with your career. Post associations also hold career fairs. They actually get you, um, some of them have funds to get you to the National Post Office Association, which you should join also, because sometimes they give you free, give you free joints to your school. BCU allows you to get a free membership to the National Post Office Association, and you can do that. They have different things coming through their listserv. They actually have, um, I think, a program on diversity coming up that just came through my listserv. So that's like some other opportunities that you can look at. So. Everything you get, take those opportunities because it's the wealth of information. Even if you don't use it, at least it'll be there in your inbox ready for you. And what are the drawbacks? I think you've heard some of them. Your time, your blood, your sweat, your tears. You know, again, you have to find that balance because that's the only way you're going to make it through the postdoc. You know, I don't, I can't tell you that I love, I love my postdoc. I'll tell anybody I love my job. I love what I do. But sometimes I'll be like, I really want to be here. And it's just the continuous, you know, and you're going to have moments like that. And that's just, that's just part of anything. But you have to remember what your overall, overall goal is. Make that time for yourself. Again, the salary ain't that great. So if you're looking here and make some big money, not, not this, when you get out there, yes. But as I said, don't don't ever give up, even when you're in your postdoc. Don't ever give up while you're in it. Don't ever give up in your search for one. Because again, you are an awesome person. And anybody would be crazy not to want you at your postdoc. Thanks very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yes. Oh, wait. You, I heard you raise first, and then I'll get you. Yes. Uh, so, I've heard that uh, most postdocs or PIs expect uh, you to have some publications before they they hire you. 
That's true. I've heard that. Too. I've heard that as well. I experienced that as well. Um, my PI actually took me with no publications because he knew what my children were. But I've heard at least one. You don't have to have a thousand. At least one was really great. So I was going to ask if um, you're almost out the door at this point and you don't have one, how do you go about trying to get a, a poster? Well, what I would do is, again, go through the other post docs that you know where you want to go or you have an idea. Go through the other post docs and see what it is. But still submit your application because in your research statement, you can spin that. You can spin your lack of publication record into a positive and then how you're willing to, okay, did my expectations of my first year would be to get X amount, you know, maybe one or two publications out, out of the team. Because a lot of it depends on what's weighted. A lot of times publications aren't heavily weighted. Everything else looks stellar and it's great. So I would just go with that. If you get, into, you get an interview, you know, spin, again, spin it. Like, yes, I'm, you know, I don't have publication right now, but here's some thoughts and ideas that I saw that your lab is working on. You know, are there publication opportunities at the lab? So when I come into the gate, I can have a publication my first year. I did it. It's okay. I was at the gate. Yes. You talked a little bit about side projects, but um, have you had conversations or how do you have conversations about what data you can kind of like leave the postdoc with or what ideas you can kind of evolve and take with you when you leave compared to what your PI's grants are for? Or that, that's a very good question. And that's something you have to set up with your mentor. That's a talk that you have to have with them, especially when they start talking about when you're developing your career plan and where you're going. That's something you sit down because you may not be able to take the data when you leave. They might be like, no, you don't get anything. But you have to find that information up front. And I definitely would recommend, again, talk to other post docs. But if you can't, that's, you know, you can sit down if you have an interview. That's one of the questions that I would be, you know, I would bring up. It's not a bad question. You know, they're either going to be honest or you're not going to be like, no, you can't have data or, you know, yes, you can. And that might be your deciding factor in actually a, getting into that a postdoc and accepting that position. But set that up before. Don't wait till the end when you're leaving. Definitely set that up and have that talk before you leave. Um, if you are applying to like different fellowships and industry positions, would you still recommend applying to 15 to 15 postdocs as well? Like if you are undecided and you're just seeing where, you know, where things play out. That was the golden number that I was the 10 to 15 because okay. again, thousands of people are applying to those same places. But if you're solidified in you, this is your own individual thing, if you're solidified in you and how many you apply to, then go with that. How many did you apply for? 10 I, 15? Actually, I never, I remember, again, mine was created for me. Mine was created for me. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't have to go through the whole application process. But like I said, some of my friends that did go that process, 15 to 20, because they're like, I'm going to at least land one of these. And a lot of times you can transfer some of you already got your you already got your C D. Right. You can retailor the research statement a little bit. You change the cover letter. You don't once you have the skeleton, it's not too bad to change everything a little bit else. Recommendation letters are probably the same. Right. Yes. Yeah, um I can add to that in that there's not really a magic number. And it kind of changes as you go through the process. I probably sent inquiries to about 10 people. I got three interviews, but I only went to one. So it just, it, it, you really have to feel it out as you go along. And there's no great number. It, it'll depend. OK, so you inquired about 10, but you didn't officially apply to 10? Is that? I mean, um, Really, the one that I got, the one that I chose, they're, they're still doing the official application right now. Okay. But the PI's already taken me, so, yeah. Well, awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? I'm hiring postdocs. She's hiring postdocs. Hiring four postdocs. She's hiring four. <laughs> IQ.vc.edu. <laughs> <laughs> she ate all this work. Write that down with us. I'll send that out. Okay. Yeah, thank you. They're gonna send it out. <laughs> Look at that.
opportunities. All right, well, thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Again, so much fun. <laughs> I'm going to show you individually again. I'm staying around for like 10 to 15 minutes. So.